Our scripture reading for today comes from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 and 30, through 30. And that is also in your worship bulletin. And so as you are pointing in there, uh, I know uh, some of you all have some reports that you want to give for the last Sunday sermon. Y'all heard me at home, right? Chantil remembered and she submitted her homework. I don't, want to, I don't want to delay this sermon any longer because someone also said last week they could have listened to me preach for three and a half more hours. And so I'm really motivated to preach today. So we'll collect those assignments at the end. But focusing on our scripture reading of Ephesians, chapter 5, 21 through 30. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. So as to represent the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or a wrinkle or anything of the kind, yet so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own body, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, as we do come with so much celebration today, we also do come seeking wisdom from your scripture, seeking guidance in accordance with your will. So in this time of reflection, I ask that the words I speak might be consistent with your will. And at the same time, if there is anyone that needs to hear a different message this morning, I ask that you might speak to their heart, mind, and soul, that they may be aware of the love, care, peace, and comfort that you offer in this morning. What's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. There are a lot of different things that I do in preparing for a sermon, and it's not always the same, but this past week, one of the things that I did was I listened to a book on CD in my car as I was driving around about church membership issues, both from the clergy side as well as from the congregational side. I listened to one more modern day sermon um, of a minister that was preaching in San Antonio on the scripture passage. And then I listened to an old time minister. You could tell it was long ago because of all the crackling sounds that were in the background. But again, addressing this text, this passage of scripture. And there's a lot of things that you can glean from this passage this morning, but I want to make sure you hear me clearly in the fullness of the message, just like the fullness of the scripture. Because I know if I only read part of this verse this morning, that I would be looking for a job this afternoon. <laughs> I would have all the women ready to greet me after church, and they might want to share an opinion. Do we like it when women share an opinion? Yes. Yeah, that's a trick question. <laughs> one of the commentaries, even in 1953, when the commentaries took this particular group of passages, it referred to this as being mutual subordination or mutual subjection. 
And I love that, that even in 1953, when maybe all our churches weren't there yet, there is an understanding that as we read this scripture, that it is not about one over and above the other, but it is about something mutual. Men don't get to order their wives around and everything they do, do they? Smart answer, guys. <laughs> and neither do women get to boss their men around on every single issue every time. Some issues? Yes. But what it means to be mutual, what it means to really invest in one another. And there's another beautiful part of this passage. It is a a dual themed passage. Because what we also see is an understanding of how there is a relationship with God and the church. With Christ and the church. So we see this broader understanding of relationship. And even though we know the obvious, sometimes we need, we need reminders, don't we? Let's say, for example, <coughs> Hazel and I fall in love. And Hazel and I get married. Mind your own business if you have an opinion. <laughs> Notice I didn't ask her to marry me because I'm afraid she said no and screw up the sun. <laughs> but let's say Hazel and I decide we're madly in love and we're going to get married. And so on our wedding day, there's all that beautiful harmony. There is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, right? Kind of like we want church to be, right? We come in with the hope for that sweet, sweet spirit. And Hazel and I have that sweet, sweet and we have a wonderful wedding and then we get into the flow of life. So on Monday, I leave Hazel behind and I go to work. I might think of her some during the day, but I don't pay her any attention, right? Go home, go to work Tuesday. Don't pay her much mind. Think of her maybe and how wonderful and sweet she is, but not a whole lot more. Wednesday, Thursday, the same thing. Friday, mostly the same thing. Until late in the day, because everybody knows what Friday is, right? Saturday, you go to bed early, right, Ben? Everybody goes to bed early on Saturday because you've got to get up early for church. So Friday is date night. So I take Hazel out for a nice dinner. We have a nice conversation through dinner. And then I leave her and I go back to my regular routine. Because she knows then how much I love her and what priority she has in my life, right? Is she going to be convinced of how much I love her? Are you? <laughs> By what I say, what I do, yes. Thank you. Good answer. That's a good church answer, too, isn't it? But the reality is, many of us, that is the relationship we have with the church. Maybe even the relationship we have with our faith. And it's nothing new. It was just a different way to present that idea to you again. To think about how you interact with the church. Are you someone that comes and gives God and the church love for a couple of hours on Sunday morning and think, I've got my deeds covered. I'm good. I'm gold. Does that really represent the love we have for the church? We see in the scripture, as we lay out the account of the relationship with a man and a wife, the desire to outserve one another, basically. To continue to try to out-love one another. Wouldn't it be great if all of our relationships, even in friendships, if that was our goal, if we lived to out-love one another? Wouldn't we get rid of a lot of problems that way? Just think if our kids tried to out-love one another. It would be a different world, wouldn't it? But in the midst of that, as we deal with the concept of church, and we think about God, is it possible to outlove God? It's not possible, is it? But do we even try? Do we even make that a priority enough in our life, the daily weaving of the nature of who we are, our very being, that God knows how much we love God and how much we want to be in love with the church. When you look at the church as described in the scripture and in other scriptures, Jesus refers to the church as what? As his bride. That type of love, that type of affection, 
that type of respect, that type of investment. Investing in what we are as a church. Now, we have a great building, we have a great JCAC, we have a great storm shelter, right? Last Wednesday. It's a little smelly, but it's great. <laughs> Get dogs in there and people, it's going to smell. But that's not what church is, is it? And that's not what the scriptures make reference to either. The church is you and I as we gather in community. And part of what we see in church, even in this, this is a letter, is it not? And Paul has the other letters that he has written that we find in the New Testament. It is a letter to a church. A group of people, according to scripture, who come together and gather for worship, singing, and the breaking of bread. What it is to be a community, to invest in a community. One of the interesting things I thought as I was um, listening to those sermons and listening to the book on the CD was um, they highlighted membership in a church is mandatory to be faithful to the scriptures. Now, I'm not going to go that far. I'm not sure I really fully believe it in the way that they expressed it, but I do think church membership is very important because it's a sign of that dedication. When you come forward and you join the church, even if you have already given your life to Christ, you come forward and you give a witness to these group of people that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you are committed to this group of people to share with them, to strive with them to express an outloving of God in our community and around even within. We strive to be what God has called us to be at the church, and sometimes it's inconvenient, isn't it? We talk about what it is to, to be a part of a church in the life. Some of us give 10 hours a week. Maybe that's a little too much. Maybe you need to stop and give self-care and care for others. Don't let the church be the way you avoid other things. At the same time, if you don't give any time to the church, you're not really being faithful to what it is to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, are you? And yes, I like membership, and I think membership is important. But also what I think is what we do when we give membership to a church, or where we give love to one another. In essence, what we are doing is we are staking a claim. Now, I'm going to say a date, and I want to see who knows the answer. What took place on April 22nd of 1889? The great? Made the run? What's another word for it? The great lane run. And I'm not going to get into the whole issue about what Oklahoma Sooners means. <laughs> I know this much Oklahoma history, and that's about what it is. But that was people going and staking a claim in a new land to build a future, right? Looking for land that offered promise and hope. Hopefully, when you come to this church, that's a part of what you are staking a claim in, that you want to be a part. You say, I am a member of First Christian Church, or I am participating in First Christian Church, and you claim to be a part of this group. Sometimes that means you got to embrace the ugliness, right? Sometimes that means we have to learn to forgive one another, but it means that we strive to be what God has claimed this church to be. We know that we look at the scriptural account and the historical account of what it meant to become a Christian, that a lot was involved. If I told you all we're going to start another new member class, we're going to start it now, and graduation will be in three years. How many of you how many of y'all be like, I want some of that? <laughs> Membership classes typically last like during Advent. Let's call that Lent instead of Advent. Lent, <laughs> leading up to Easter, right? Or a short time, a short time ago. But the original church, when they would go through membership issues, 
people making that commitment, staking that claim, it was a three-year process of instruction, of prayers, of learning. They literally had to leave the worship area when it came time to receive communion. It was very instructional. It was very intentional. And when we state this claim of faith that we have, I know we are equally intentional. That we are equally purposeful in what we do. Maybe not three years worth of classes. Maybe not 45 minutes of a sermon. But that we are convicted with our faith so much that we want to live it out. And that we want to live it out as described here in one-on-one -on -one relationships as well as the community relationship. The community of the church. When you look at this passage, I want you to kind of focus in there. And unfortunately, I highlighted it in blue, so it's hard to read the numbers. <laughs> and I'm old. 27. When we think about this church community we have, and we imagine lifting up this community to God, out of the goodness with which God has provided it, what we give back. Do we think of the church when we present it? To be a place of splendor without spot or wrinkle of any kind. Yes, that the church, that she may be holy and without blemish. As we celebrate Mother's Day and the way mothers have invested in us, that we might be more. Let us think also about the church and our commitment to the church. That we might lift the church up, that it might be more. That in all of those things and those relationships, both individual and communal, that we might celebrate what God has given us in relationship, what God has given us in the church, what God has given us in grace and mercy through the cross. Thanks be to God.